It's such a pleasure to be here, see so many bright young eyes. And I, it's honestly going to be hard talking about music after what you just heard. Um, so, but I, I think many of you grew up excelling in many activities. At least it was true for myself. When I was young, I played Dombra, which is a three-string Russian national instrument. Uh, you can think of it as Russian banjo. This is me playing with their orchestra. Yeah, I wasn't bad at it. <laughs> But I also had another passion, science. For a long time, music and science lived coherently in my life until the point when I need to decide what to do next. And I had a conversation with my parents. Uh, well, we, won't, we all went through this lecture, and I decided to do science. But today I'm very happy that I have chosen that path, because my passion to music helps me to do science. And in my presentation, I want to show you what I do and how I combine chemistry and physics to do research in the most musical of all techniques I was able to find, MRI. So why MRI? First of all, it's pretty cool. This technique allows to look deep inside you without cutting you, even without touching you. It allows to study function of organs and in real time, without, as we call it, non-invasively. But as a researcher, I'm very happy because MRI is also a very fruitful field to do research. It's very bulky, it's expensive, not everyone can afford it, it's loud, claustrophobic. So how can we improve it and why our knowledge of music can help? First of all, you need to know what MRI can see. And in fact, MRI sees water. Yes, simply water. We are 60% water, and as we all know, water consists of three atoms, one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. So it turns out that nuclei of hydrogen atoms have a property called spin. You can think of spin as a little tiny magnet, which can be manipulated using magnetic fields. So what I like about spins, they act as little tiny spies. They report on their surrounding to us without actually affecting it. So how can you do MRI with nuclear spins in water? So in order to do and observe MRI signal, you need to have three components. First, you need to have a strong magnetic field. Second, you need to use radio frequency fields in order to generate and make your spins to process in this field. And third, you need to use a detector. In MRI, we simply use coils and made of wire. Every day, MRI researchers look at diagrams like this one. This is so-called pulse sequence, and it shows a timing, exact timing of events when fields should turn on and on, off, in order to generate a signal. So one day I was late at work, I looked at this picture on my computer, and I realized that I actually never left the music. Because what I looked at was the music score, and I understood finally that I'm actually a conductor, playing and leading, advising all of these millions of billions nuclear spins. Indeed, think about it, there are so many different members in the orchestra, for example, violins, cellos, flutes, timpanis, but there's also so many types of different nuclear spins, for example, protons, carbons, phosphorus, sodium, all of them possess a property called spin, and then can, they can generate uh, MRI signal. So now we are ready to understand why MRI requires high magnetic fields. Imagine that you don't have a magnetic field, so all of your spins point in different directions. So now, when you start to detect their signal, you'll hear something like that. Do you hear it? Yeah, there's some signal, but there's so much noise, right? How would be better if we were able to align all the spins in the same direction? Obviously, they all could generate a signal in a coherent manner. Just listen. The same concentration of molecules can produce MRI signal, which is thousands of times higher than it was possible before that. So, once again, in order to get image, you have nuclear spins. And 
if you have no magnetic fields, there is no, as we call it, alignment or polarization, and your signal is low and there is a lot of noise. However, if you have complete alignment, or as we call it, hyperpolarization, you can generate a very strong signal. So it turns out that these days, even in the fields of most expensive and highest magnetic fields, we can create something similar to that. And in order to generate image like that, you actually need to wait and lay down in the MRI machine for hours to collect many, many, many times your signal and remove noise. So would it be much better if in a fraction of a second we were able to get an image like that with the resolution approaching the micron? So we basically reached limits where physics can help to do it. And as you know, when physicists cannot do something, they ask chemists whether they can help. <laughs> so when chemists decided, OK, let's try something. What's the simplest molecule we can find? It's hydrogen molecule. So in reality, it didn't work like that. But it's indeed true. Hydrogen molecule is a unique, uh, unique object. It's so small that it actually possesses and obeys the rules of quantum mechanics. And these rules are really weird. So for example, you remember that Schrodinger cat can be either dead or alive. So the same is true for hydrogen molecule. It can exist in only two nuclear spin states. First of them called orthohydrogen, where it's a state in which nuclear spins point in the same direction. Another state is parahydrogen, a state in which nuclear spins point in opposite directions. So it turns out that it's so easy to obtain parahydrogen just simply by cooling hydrogen gas and storing this gas in a tank. So what we do as chemists, we use this hydrogen, parahydrogen, in reactions, and then by us, uh, doing these hydrogenation reactions and using magnetic fields, we can actually provide a complete alignment of nuclear spins. So in case if you have 100% yield of your, on, in your reaction, you can actually produce 100% polarization. So this is absolutely remarkable because you can use this polarization for many, many, many different applications. For example, think of building a polarizer, and this is what we're doing in the lab. We're building a portable polarizer, a machine that we can bring and put near the MRI scanner. So this polarizer can produce boluses of hyperpolarized molecules. You can inject these molecules in a living patient. Uh, yeah, he's not going to die from that. So, and not only see where these molecules are going in your body, but also see what chemistry is happening with them. So it's really remarkable. And you see, this is my undergraduate students who helped me. They're very happy to do that. Yeah, Heinrich. <laughs> uh, so I just want to say that for me, building these machines, which might sound complicated and bulky, it's actually like building a musical instrument. Yes, it doesn't look like Steinway, <laughs> but we're working on it. You know? um, so actually, this technology opens up new applications which we haven't even thought of. So since you have such a high magnetic field, or such a high polarization, you don't need high magnetic fields anymore to observe MRI signal. For example, you can do MRI in the fields comparable to the field of the fridge magnet. So this image, for example, was obtained in the field, same field as the field produced by this magnet. And it not only has the resolution comparable to high field instruments, it's actually better because we did this imaging directly during hydrogen bubbling, which wouldn't be possible at high field due to inhomogeneities introduced by this. So when I think about potential future of this research, it's truly groundbreaking. Because now, with high polarization, you, when you don't need high magnetic fields anymore, you can build open geometries, systems where you can go and stand, be free to move, no loud voices and sounds, no claustrophobia. It, MRI will become more affordable, for example, in developing countries. But what excites me as a scientist is actually future scientific applications of this technique. For example, since you have such a high polarization, you don't need big samples to produce your signal. For example, you can study volume so small, comparable to the size of a living cell, and still generate enough signal to be able to detect it. Or you can go to another extreme. Since you don't need to produce high magnetic fields anymore, you can do research directly at Earth's field and study, for example, industrial-scale chemical reactors. So this is really exciting, and this is my passion. I try to combine music and it helps me to see and to invent new things in science. And I really hope that you all and some of you definitely find your passion in life, because a person without a passion is like an orchestra without a conductor. You can still have your spins, they're just not polarized. <laughs>